Okay, I want, uh, first, thanks for inviting, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I want to say, I feel like this talk is a bit of an, an outlier in this conference, but maybe it's, maybe it's good. It's going to be less about uh, theory and, um, and algorithms and more about um, applications and challenges and data sets, especially in the context of genomics and personalized medicine and electronic patient records with specific focus on the growing problem of antibiotic resistance of bacterial pathogens becoming resistant to antibiotics. And even though um, this is not a conference on antibiotic resistance, I don't think I need much introduction. I, I, I'm sure most of the people in the audience are aware that this is a growing public health concern. Bacteria have eff effectively found a way to evade every single antibiotic that has been introduced uh, medically so far. And what we see more are bacteria pathogens that infect us, acquiring resistance to multiple uh, drugs, making them um, resistant to all treatment, uh, which uh, ultimately cause those uh, what we hear in the, in the, in the news as uh, superbugs that are very hard to treat. So uh, moving, uh, moving forward, we, we and others are, are thinking about paradigm changes in the treatment and diagnostics and treatment of infectious uh, disease. For diagnostics, we want to think about predictive diagnostics based on the g reading out the millions of letters making the genome of the pathogen, based on the electron electronic patient records of the patient. And we want to think about diagnostics that tell us not only what the pathogen is capable of doing today, but what it may evolve to become and being capable tomorrow. And uh, I, this is going to be uh, my talk for today. And then there are also thoughts about how we can use this diagnostic to uh, guide um, more advanced uh, treatment. But this is not what we're going to talk about today. So how does, uh, oops. Okay. How does diagnostic look like today? Well, mostly it's uh, what we call culture-based. Right? I have an infection, let's say uh, infection in, in uh, the urine. I go to the physician, I give a sample. What happened, that sample go to the clinical lab. The, the, the physician, physician will tell us, I'm going to do a culture. What does it mean? We're going to give some food to the bacteria. They're going to go. It takes time. We wait, wait, wait. And then we're going to throw different antibiotics on, uh, on the bacteria and see if, uh, if it kills them or not. And that information comes back to the physician. We think that in the future, much of it is going to be uh, replaced or at least augmented with reading out the genome of the pathogen. Already today, we can do it very fast, very effectively, very cheaply. And that, that uh, amounts to some, um, a few millions of, of, uh, of letters making up the genome of, of a given pathogen isolated from, from an infection. Based on that genome, we can already say if, uh, many things. We can very easily say uh, what species it is. We are starting to learn how to say, is it susceptible or resistant to uh, different antibiotics? I want to show you some on how we do that. But we think more, uh, more than that, we can actually give information that is currently not accessible to, uh, to us in, in the classical method. We can say something about the history of the pathogen, where it's coming from, what's its infection network, what's the challenges, the main uh, selection pressures it, uh, it sees within, within our body. It's a single patient level, it's a population level. And we want to say something about the future of the pathogen. How pathogenic it is, it's now in my, my blood, how likely it is to go to the, to the kidney, to, 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 to the blood, how likely it is to, for, a given, uh, for it to become resistant to a given antibiotic, even though it's sensitive uh, right, right now. So we, we want to think about algorithms that would tell us, read the genome and tell us what is the capacity of that genome currently and what its uh, ability to, to evolve. So to do that, we need to start map, uh, just generating vast data sets, vast data sets of different mutations, different changes in the genome that can allow bacteria to, to resist to a uh, range of, uh, of, anti, of antibiotics. And I want to show you some of the little steps we do today to, towards that vision, some on... Um, systematically mapping the genetic changes uh, uh, that allow bacteria to, to become resistant to antibiotic in the lab and in actually in the, within the clinical setting. So in the lab, how, how would that work? Well, it's, in a way, it's kind of a very simple experiment. We're going to take bacteria, throw some antibiotic on them. Most of them die. Few that have, have evolved would survive, and we can 
then read out the genome and see what, what changed. So this is great, but this is great to see the first step. But in reality, when bacteria adapt, they can then acquire more and more steps, making them more and more uh, resistant to, to, to be able to follow those multi-mutational steps, mu st changes and changes and changes that lead to high-level resistance. We need to keep ramping, ramping up the selective pressure, keep increasing the dosage of the antibiotic to challenge the bacteria to evolve. And I want to show you two devices that we have developed to, to do uh, just that. Kind of, you can think about them as benchtop evolution devices, uh, devices that allow us to watch evolution in real time in the lab as a bacteria uh, accumulate mutation. In one of these devices, we're going to ramp up the concentration in, in time in a well-mixed environment, and in another, we're going to ramp it up in space and let bacteria uh, swim through that. And I'm going to go through that uh, fairly uh, briefly because I, I understand this is uh, out of, of the topic of, of, of this conference. But essentially, we have um, a device which is it's kind of fun. It's a computer-controlled uh, system where the computer watches the bacteria and says, hey, they're too happy, let's throw more drug on them. Oh, they're almost dying, let's dilute the drug out. So it keeps them constantly a challenge. They evolve resistance. It sees that and keeps increasing the concentration of the antibiotic. So it's kind of like, like, like that. Okay. So now uh, here is a device. And when we put bacteria in these devices, we see very uh, dramatic increase in antibiotic resistance, some 1,000 fold in the concentration of the drug needed to kill the bacteria very dramatic increase over two or three weeks of selection. You can see that it happens through multiple steps. These are different replicates. They all get to about the same level fairly quickly. And now what we want is to open up this genome and see, see what happened, what are the changes. And before I show you that, I want to show you this other device that, where we allow bacteria to swim in, in space. This is essentially uh, a Petri dish, but just scaled up to, to that size. And it's made of slabs like that of increasing concentration of an antibiotic. And we just going to put bacteria on the side. Is it possible to turn off the light here? No. AV man? No. Okay. <laughs> Bear with me. Try to, to, to see it. Um, okay. So in this particular case, it's set in a symmetric way. There is no antibiotic on the side, and increasing concentration, increasing by a ton, a lot towards the middle. We're going to put bacteria here and here, and let them swim and see what happens. Here it is. The goal is to fill up the space. I'm going to stop the video here. What happens, they reach that boundary, they want to go forward, but the only way for them to do that is to mutate and, and evolve, and we're going to see it in action if we rerun the movie. We're going to see penetration of a single bacterium, finding a way to do it, and then the whole lineage now resisting that concentration, and the process repeats itself when they reach the second boundary, second secondary mutation, the peer, and now they can go at 10 times the concentration, and, and so on and so forth. After some 10 days of selection, we have bacteria that have evolved a 1,000-fold increase in their ability to handle that particular drug. Um, this is obviously a, um, kind of a capturing uh, video, but also it's a um, very powerful tool because now we can kind of open, open the lid and sample all of these points. And again, we have ways to read out those genomes very uh, quickly and, and effectively and cheaply. And now we can start uh, in a systematic way mapping, the, generating the databases of what are the different changes that can allow bacteria to resist. This is one antibiotic, but others as well, as well as uh, combinations. Okay, and then we start getting at maps like that is just a simplification, but for different drugs, what are the different genetic changes that uh, can allow resistance? You see, for some drugs, there's uh, fairly, uh, kind of a different alternative ways of doing it. For others, every time we run the experiment, we get almost the exact same changes. In fact, even the order in which these mutations accumulate, I'm not going to describe in detail, but even the order in which these mutations accumulate uh, tend to be preserved. So if uh, I see uh, two mutations, A and B, appearing in one replicate, it's quite likely I'm going to see these two mutations appearing in that same order in another uh, run of, of the experiment. Okay. Okay, so what, what, what does it mean? It means, let, let's think about this very simple picture. Every time I, 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 have an, I look at an observation of evolution, even though it's, the underlying process is stochastic, right? mutations appear by chance, even though the underlying process is stochastic, it actually uh, appears fairly deterministic. Right? So when, when I look at a pattern like that, of a repeatable uh, evolution pattern like that, uh, I would say I'm getting two things from, from this. One 
is the notion of predictability, right? You can start developing algorithms that can follow this data and say, hey, I've seen something similar in the past. It's likely that this is going to be the next move of, the, of evolution. This is what we, we need to prepare for. Second, when we see a pattern like that, I would argue this given, uh, it's kind of shouting that these mutations must be very important for, uh, for the pathogen for surviving in these particular conditions, because exactly the same thing happened over and over and over. So uh, I would say for, for, for the next um, 10 minutes of the talk, what I want to do, I'm not sure what's the time. Mm. The time is not running here, so someone would have to give me a sign. Hello? 20, okay. Maybe tell me a 10 again, because this is, uh, he, this is says 30, so I feel like I'm completely fine. Okay. Um, so I want to take th th this uh, notion that when I see, uh, I, I look in a database of, uh, of mutation, I see uh, repeatability, same thing happen, happen again and again, that give me uh, a reason to, to believe that these mutations that repeat themselves are very important. I want to take this notion from the very simple environment of bacteria evolving in a tube like that to the very complex environment of bacteria evolving during infection, the most complex scenario uh, within us um, in, in the real world. But the, the principle is, is exactly the same. We're going to take samples over time and, and see what changes and look for repeated patterns. Um, in a way, how would we do that experiment? Well, we need to go and um, choose a cohort of individuals and go and infect them. Any volunteers for that? No? <laughs> but <laughs> oh, this side, this side. Okay. But the beauty is that we don't quite need to do that experiment because that, this experiment and many other uh, experiments are happening for, for free, in a way, in, in the real world when pathogens are going and infecting multiple people and we have the same pathogen going and evolving within individual patients. So uh, th that paradigm of let's just watch what happened out in the clinic is in gather a ton, ton of data, genomic data and patient record data. This paradigm is really um, leading ma much of the, the way we, we ask questions and do, and do research in, in, in this world today. Okay, so in this particular case, I want to show you one little example in, in a way. It's, uh, I don't want to get you into the, the clinical side, but pathogens that went and infected uh, multiple individuals in, in a hospital we worked with uh, in, in Boston. And it's a very severe uh, disease, and because of the severity of the disease, the uh, hospital we worked with uh, kept isolate, actual bacteria isolated from these patients over time for multiple different patients. And uh, I want to say these type of data sets are vast. They exist everywhere you go to, uh, to any, any hospital here in, or, in, uh, or abroad. They have tons, tons of data like that, of isolated that have been uh, uh, f uh, um, recovered from, from people over, o over years. Here in this particular case, we simply took them out of the freeze, freeze and um, just started by reading out the genomes. Again, it's very easy, and asked what, what do we see. And first, first thing we see is that um, these actually <laughs> things are happening. Mutations are accumulating uh, over time. It's kind of like they keep accumulating mutations, it's kind of like they keep uh, a clock, like there's a, like a timestamp in the genome. If uh, you give me a genome from uh, those millions of letters from uh, this um, outbreak, I can tell you in, uh, to some accuracy at what time it was isolated. Right? It's written on, on, on the genome. But more than that, because we have multiple mutations uh, accumulating, we can start to uh, um, reveal the phylogeny, the relatedness between the isolates. Who is the parent of who, right? All the ones that are similar, the, the uh, algorithms, again, I won't go into, into uh, the basics of that, but the algorithms that you can imagine that allow us to give, uh, to say, this is the most parsimonial uh, tree that connects these, these isolates. And now that I have this tree, I can start asking, do I see evolution, like we said, happening in parallel in different sections of this, of this uh, tree. So here is one particular gene. Gene is just an area in, in the genome, uh, in a way, it's kind of a sentence in, in the genome. Here's one particular gene that has uh, different variants in, in the collection. 
It actually has one main variant. It's kind of the parental variant, the gray. It has four other different variants. But, and this is key, and that actually repeats itself um, in many of the analyses we do. Um, when you do any type of uh, machine learning on uh, this type of data, you want to take into account the, the actual uh, phylogeny, the family tree of the isolates to separate between independent mutational events compared to things that are similar but appear by descendancy. For example, all of these blue here, right? You say, hey, how many times I got them? One, two, three, four, five, six, ten. No. This, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of misleading myself. In fact, it's really one mutation that happened here, right, that gave rise to all of these ten, and so, and so on, for, right, and so forth for, for, for the rest. So uh, it's kind of a key to separate between, uh, to kind of think about uh, algorithms that separate between de novo um, uh, changes that we can reveal by having the phylogeny compared to actual presentation of something that just reports for seeing the same thing over and over and over, but it's really one, one event. Okay, so now we can count the number of access here, and it's a number of independent mutation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and say, wow, uh, in, in comparison to, to other genes, which I don't show you, uh, this is just very surprising. So that genes must be evolving repeatedly and must therefore be important for the pathogen. In this case, we can actually make a guess, important for what? Well, in this case, we actually know this gene. It's a, it's a target of one of the antibiotics used in this patient. So we can imagine it's important for the bacteria to resist the antibiotic. And in fact, think about it, we actually have those pathogens now in the lab, so I can throw the antibiotic on them and see do they resist it, resist it or not. And that's exactly what happened. Every time we made a guess that they would become more resistant, that's exactly what, what we see. But more generally, we can now ask the algorithm, give us all the genes that have this pattern of repeated mutations throughout the phylogeny, and that... Um, um, results in a fairly short list of, of genes. And, and again, this is not a biology seminar, so I'm, I don't want to go into any details, but I do want you to appreciate that simply by looking at uh, genomes, the data, those millions of letters, and doing comparison between them and building the phylogeny, looking for repeated patterns, we can get something I, I find quite incredible. We can get to see from the eye point of view of the uh, pathogen, what are the main challenges that it sees during infections within us? What are they? Well, antibiotic resistance, it needs to deal with the membrane, it needs to sense oxygen, different things that we thought about, things that we didn't think about, but the principle is simply by looking at, at this data, again, those millions of, of letters from, from uh, many pathogens, and doing comparison analysis on this data, we can get an um, a point of view from, of the pathogen, of the main challenges it experiences within our body during infection. But if you think about it, and you followed uh, the premise of what I, what I told you, the premise was, let's do a comparison analysis of what evolutionary patterns appear at, at the genome level when the pathogen goes and infects multiple different individuals, and what are the repeated patterns. But now, what happens if I'm sitting in my clinic and a single patient comes by? Only one patient. I can't compare it to, to anything. Can I still say something? And, okay, so we want to go from whole population to zoom in on a single patient. And I, I would argue we can still maybe do something uh, similar, look for repeated patterns, if, that's a key, if evolution within the patient doesn't quite look like that, but it can rather look more like that when there are multiple different lineages coexisting within the same individual. We kind of want to know, is evolution of the pathogen, the bacteria within the patient, does it look more like those well-mixed uh, tubes that I've shown you in the beginning, or does it look more like this big plate where multiple different lineages coexist in parallel? If this is the case, then we can start asking, are there repeated patterns that occur genes that evolve in parallel in those different uh, li uh, lineages. Okay, so which of these patterns is more uh, correct? Well, we went back to these patients, and instead of the clinical practice of isolating one bacterium from a sample, we went and isolated many. It's fairly easy to do. We just take the, these are uh, sputum sample, 
The patient just uh, spit on, on a plate, the colonies, we can pick them up and just read out all of these genomes. And it was quite incredible to see that this huge diversity, even in a single time point, single sample, contains huge diversity of, of, uh, of genomes. And, because, and we can, again, reconstruct the phylogeny of these genomes. And remember, we have kind of the, the clock. We know how many clicks per year happen in this clock. So we can estimate the time they diverge from uh, their common parent. And that time, it was kind of fun, uh, exactly uh, um, agree with what we know on this and other patients when uh, they were inf infected. So the picture we have in mind, the bacteria are coming in and evolving but not with mutations replacing the population, but rather multiple mutations leading to diversification and multiple lineages coexisting. And that really allows us now to go and ask, do we see uh, repeated patterns occurring in parallel along these uh, coexisting lineages within a single patient? And the answer is, is yes, and that really allows us now to go and start assigning um, challenges, the selection pressure, the environment that affect the, that is important for the pathogen, start assigning that to at the level or not of the whole population, but rather at the, at the single patient level. Some of these challenges are going to be shared between patients and some are unique, representing uh, specific treatments applied to these patients or uh, something specific to the immune uh, response of, that, of, these, uh, of these individuals. Okay, let me see how we are doing uh, with time. Okay. Um, I think what, what I, I, I want to do is just tell you what I'm not going to tell you, which is, you can imagine taking the same approach and going even uh, site-specific, exactly with the same principle. Can we take individual biopsies like that? And are they diverse? And if so, are there genes that evolve in parallel in those coexisting lineages within, uh, within site. And this way we can uh, reveal site-specific or organ-specific challenges acting on, on the pathogen. And again, I think the, the key I want to uh, emphasize within the context of, of this um, conference is that it, it's kind of fun because we can do all of that Without, in a way, without any uh, physiological measurement, without any um, molecular measurement, simply by analyzing uh, um, genomes and, and repeated patterns and being aware of the idea of, of uh, phylogenetic dependencies. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Okay. And... Um, and tell you one, one, more, one more thing to, to allow me to, to kind of um, bring it uh, to, to semi-closure, semi which is uh, another um, really uh, powerful thing we can, uh, we can say about, about the pathogen simply by looking at the genomes is uh, revealing networks of infections, of epidemiological network, of who infected uh, who. Because I have, the, I, have the, uh, I have the genome, I can re rebuild the phylogeny, and I know ancestry, so I can say, hey, these two people, not, not that, not only the similar pathogens have infected each other, we can actually get directionality. I, I, I carry the parent of the pathogen in there, so I am, I am the person who infected that person. So it's kind of, just by reading out those genomes, we can infer the whole network of uh, spread of the pathogen in the population and even within the body, within different uh, organs. Okay, so I want to uh, sum up and give you some nuggets of uh, the future and where we're going from here. I, what I've shown you is that um, the data coming from reading out those millions of letters making up genomes of uh, pathogens contain, if you know how to read it, contain valuable information. It, in a way, if you think about the infections I've just shown you, uh, and you give me a pathogen from there and isolate from one, one of the patients, I can tell you it kind of has a, a, a time step. I can tell you what time it was isolated, which patient it came from, who infected that patient, and in a way, more importantly, what are the selection pressures, what are the challenges from the eye point of view of the pathogen acting on it 
at the population level and at the single patient level. Some of these are going to be resistant to um, the environment within the body, and some is resistant to the treatment to the antibiotics. Okay, so wh how do we, where do we go from here? In a way, all of the study that I've shown you is a very tiny study. A few samples, a few patients, a few genomes, uh, some initial analysis. But really, we want to be able to say, um, to say much more. We want to be able to predict uh, treatment success or treatment failure. We want to be able to pre predict the future spread. We want to be able to predict the chance of, of evolving uh, further. So what we're doing now is really uh, increasing this network uh, tremendously by collaborating with uh, HMOs, specifically with Maccabi and with hospital, with Rambam, and, and, and others to get like kind of a network of collection of pathogens that are coming to, to us, uh, to the lab. Way more samples, of course, way more genomes, but also, and that's key, and that's kind of a new type of information that is becoming very important in, in this era of, uh, of, uh, of big data, which is electronic patient records. For each patient, which antibiotics it took, what other comorbidity it has, age, um, gender, what's not. And then we want to kind of bring it into a um, more sophisticated uh, analysis tool that would eventually be able to predict and give information back to, to, the, to the clinician of how likely it is that a given treatment would be successful or failed, how likely it is that the pathogen is currently resistant or sensitive, and how likely it is the pathogen would become resistant or sensitive in the future given a specific treatment. I'll show you two uh, or three last slides, kind of how, how does that starting to, to look. This is data from uh, collaboration with Varda Shalev in uh, Maccabi. Um, we have essentially over um, years um, some collection of, of data from uh, different infections where we can see um, time patterns, spatial patterns of, uh, of resistance to collections of, uh, of different antibiotics. It, it's not only <laughs> just looking beautiful, it's actually it's, uh, highly complex, but in a way, some of it is, is uh, predictable, and that's what we're starting to do now. I'll just show you a bit. When you look at the single patient level, um, and you compare two samples, there's a, a notion of, of memory in, in the system. This is obviously short-term memory, the same infection, that's easy, but also from prior infections, even a year back, there's a memory. And then there's this tendency that goes back to, to, to infinity, which just represent different patients having different uh, propensities to, uh, to acquire bacteria that are resistant or sensitive to different drugs. And then the actual treatment, if you take a specific antibiotic, that would affect the chance of the bacteria evolving resistant to that particular cognate antibiotic, and these effects are also uh, long-lasting. So now what we're doing is taking these data, data sets of the electronic patient records, connecting it with uh, the genomes, the, the genomics that I've shown you, and trying to, really to uh, develop uh, more advanced tools, machine learning tools, to predict evolution of resistance. Okay. Uh, what did I show you today? I showed you those um, uh, evolution machines, those benchtop evolution machines, the big plate and the mobile stat, that really allow us to see and track in real time and map in a systematic way, get those large data sets of what are the, all the different ways by which bacteria can acquire resistance to different antibiotics. Then I've shown you that we can uh, also watch that process in real time, in situ, uh, by isolating bacteria from, uh, from patients over, over time. And we can use these genomes to re reveal, see from the eye point of view of the pathogen, what is its experience within our body. It's a population level, single patient level, and even uh, uh, specific organs or sites within our body. And finally, I've shown you how we think about the future of taking this type of approaches and connecting them with a larger amount of data, electronic patient records, to predict uh, where we have past uh, usage of antibiotics and other attributes that allow us to predict resistance to antibiotics. Okay. This work I've, I've started already when, uh, uh, in my lab uh, at Harvard, and now we are continuing it here. It's based on 
just an amazing student that have been driving it that uh, are listed here. I, I would certainly mention Michael Baim, Adam Palmer, Dal Topak, Eddie Andres, uh, Idaniel Lin, Tammy Lieberman, John Baptiste Michel, Hattie Chang, and just a fantastic collaborators at the clinic, Alex McAdam, Greg Priby, and here with uh, Varda Shalef. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.